one of the one, one of the people behind the scenes that's critical to your care is the pathologist. Uh, oftentimes, the pathologist is off in a different part of the hospital, uh, evaluating tissue and and helping the clinician figure out exactly what uh, the patho what the tissue looks like. It's become as as Hyung mentioned. As we start to think about personalized approaches to kidney cancer, the relationship between the pathologist, the surgeon, and the clinician has become ever more important. Uh, so Dan Luthringer is uh, the head of our genital urinary pathology uh, section here at, at Cedar sinai Medical Center and a professor, and he'll talk to us about how the pathology report and how what he does is important to how we then decide how to approach treatment. Dan, thanks. Uh, thanks, Bob, and thanks for the invitation to come and participate in this conference today. Um, again, I'm the guy behind the scenes who really is responsible, at least at this institution, for um, of doing uh, most of the histologic microscopic analysis of the uh, genital urinary malignancies, uh, specifically the renal cell, primarily the renal cell carcinomas. Um, All right, there's uh, really two main categories of specimens that we receive. One is our uh, uh, samples from the renal tumor itself. These can either be biopsies or resections, as Dr. Kim alluded to, and, uh, or samples from a metastatic site, a recurrence or a metastatic site. Um, the most common specimens that we see are uh, nephrectomies, resections of the tumors, and they're either the partial nephrectomies or a complete nephrectomy. And these are ex examples of some of these. The partial nephrectomy, as, as Dr. Kim uh, suggested, are smaller resections, partial resections of the entire tumor, which include a little bit of the nephric fat and a little bit of the perinephric tissue as well. Uh, the, the goal is to try to get the entire tumor out with a negative margin of resection. When the tumors are bigger, um, generally, or infiltrative, we tend to get the entire kidney. And this is an example of a nephrectomy with perinephric fat, the uh, sinus fat, drainage area down in here, maybe an adrenal gland up top, and this would be an example of a tumor that's been completely resected. Occasionally, we will, we will get uh, uh, biopsies from metastatic sites or uh, unusually from the primary renal tumor. We'll get a core biopsy usually, which is really a much smaller sample of the, the, uh, the tumor mass. Usually, it's about a millimeter or two in diameter. It's a core maybe up to several millimeters or a centimeter in length, but generally it's just a small sample of a much larger tumor. Um, a little bit about the specimen handling. Generally within a few minutes of having the tissue removed, it comes up to the pathology laboratory and we're able to do some initial assessment on it. We have workstations uh, where they will come and a pathology team will assess, let's assume it's an nephrectomy specimen, we'll look at it, measure it, cut it open, um, we'll procure some of the tissue. If there's some tissue that needs to be taken fresh for potentially for a biobank to be stored away, or maybe some tissue needs to be taken for immediate diagnosis or a margin or something like that, we'll do that. Or if, there's a, uh, the, if, the, uh, if you're enrolled in a uh, study where some fresh tissue needs to be taken and sent off to a particular institution or reference laboratory for analysis, we'll procure that as well and make arrangements to send that off on an immediate basis. And then at that point, we will do photography, tissue fixation, and over the next few hours, we will dissect the specimen, analyze it, do a lot of important um, evaluation with our eyes and ears and whatever it takes, and then we will take what are called representative sections of that tumor or the specimen, put them into these little, take sections of the, of the tissue and put them into these little capsules called cassettes, and then we process them overnight in these tissue processors. These are pretty standard uh, from institution to institution. The next morning, the tissue is taken out of the processors and it's manually placed into these other sort of uh, tissue cassettes which are filled with paraffin wax, essentially. And they're embedded in, uh, into these wax molds and then the blocks and then very thin sections, four to five microns are cut with these special microtomes. They're picked up on glass slides. They're again processed, stained, cover slipped, and then ultimately we get a, a sample of glass slides from that tumor that's been removed. On an average partial or complete nephrectomy, we'll do anywhere from five to 10 paraffin blocks, therefore equating to five to 10 glass slides. This takes about a day or two to complete this, and then the initial report and the slides are delivered to the pathologist 
um, who will begin the process of doing the microscopic analysis using obviously his microscope and whatever other tools he needs, looking at that set of slides. And it usually will be the sections from the kidney, maybe some lymph nodes, margins, adrenal gland, things like that that were provided by the surgical resection. The whole process usually takes about two to three days to complete. So there is a bit of a time lag because of mostly the, the uh, technical processing that's involved. The elements of the report, once we generate the report and it becomes available, there really are uh, sort of three categories of information which are really relevant to, um, to the, uh, to the uh, not just the diagnosis, but the future care of the patient. The first thing really is, is the diagnosis, what is the diagnosis? Is it renal cell carcinoma or some other unusual type of renal cancer? And I'll talk more about that. And then aspects related to cancer stage, the tumor size, local infiltration, has it metastasized or spread? And then other features that Dr. Kim sort of alluded to, resection margins, grade, vascular invasions. We'll talk about each of these just briefly. The first aspect is diagnosis. The important thing is to remember, and again, I think everyone in this room is a little bit beyond this, but just remember that at the initial phase, uh, tumors are resected, and it's oftentimes it's not known whether it's a renal cell carcinoma. Oftentimes it's not even known if it's even a neoplasm at all. Not all, oops, not all tumor masses are neoplastic or even malignant. I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, and so um, examples of non-tumorous masses would be things like cysts, a lot of renal cysts like this, or areas where the collecting system is dilated, called hydronephrosis or multiple cysts, can present and look just like a renal cell carcinoma, and they're resected as if they're renal cell carcinomas, but in fact they're not, they're benign. There are other types of tumors besides renal cell carcinomas. Angiomyolipomas are very common tumors. They could be big, big like this one, here's a kidney, here's a big one, they could be multiple, here's two. They could be small, one or two centimeters like this, but they all look like fatty tumor, they're not renal cell carcinomas. Different types of tumors like fibromas, oncocytomas can be very big and aggressive looking, but in fact they're not, they're not malignant at all. There are other types of malignancies, true malignancies of the kidney which are not renal cell carcinomas. Um, urothelial cancers, those tumors that are derived of the lining of the kidney, uh, that it can extend into the kidney and uh, be derived of the kidney. These are examples of some of these here. And they, these were resected thinking that these are probably renal cell carcinomas, but in fact they proved to be urothelial, not renal cell carcinomas. Different types of, uh, of uh, tumors like sarcoma can de be derived of the kidney or around the kidney. Other types of tumors can metastasize to the kidney or near the kidney, adrenal tumors, lymphomas. There's a whole host of malignancies that can mimic renal cell carcinomas. But what we're really talking about today here obviously is renal cell carcinomas, which represent probably 90% or more of all true malignancies of the kidney. And these are the tumors that are derived of the renal tubular epithelial cells, those little ducts that, that are uh, line the, um, the epithelium of the kidney. The diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma really depends, it's, it's contingent on microscopic analysis. You can't make the diagnosis any other way. The pathologist needs to look at the growth, take his sections, look at the microscopic, and then there is a spectrum, a range of features that, that will ensure the diagnosis or put it into a diagnostic category of renal cell carcinoma. Sometimes it's not so simple. Sometimes we need to employ special testing through the use of antibody immunohistochemical studies, or even as Dr. Young Kim alluded to, sometimes we need to refer to uh, some molecular analyses to put it into a diagnostic category of renal cell carcinoma. Once we've done that, the next phase is to determine the subtype. There are different, many different subtypes of renal cell carcinomas, really based primarily on the appearance of the tumor cells and their architectural growth patterns, and that sometimes we need to, again, rely on immunohistochemicals, some of the molecular properties or the genetic profiles that, um, to put us in the proper subtype category. Now, the subclassification of renal cell carcinomas and again, you probably all know this because you're all familiar with renal cell carcinomas. It's not so simple. It's an evolving, sort of complex and, and ever-changing categorization. In fact, the overall categorization of subtypes just changed just a few months ago. We like to think about renal cell carcinoma as subtypes really in sort of developmental 
uh, pathways. There's the sporadic type, those that just happen to occur just because they just happen to occur, which is probably the, the type of cancers that most people in this room have. And those are our typical, typical clear cell, chromophobe, papillary renal cell carcinomas, and maybe a few of the other rarer variants. There are those which tend to be familiar, and these represent probably 90 plus percent of all, of all renal cell carcinomas. The familial patterns, which again are, are associated, they're pretty rare, they're associated with um, uh, uh, in families, multiple tumors, uh, um, different family members can have these, and we'll talk a little bit more about these, and then there's actually gonna be a talk a little bit later in the afternoon or in the morning about genetic-based or familial-based uh, renal cell carcinomas. There are those rare, rarely associated with treatment of other types of cancers, and then there's this unusual category when you have scarred or damaged kidneys, those kidneys are at risk for developing renal cell carcinomas. So let's move through this a little bit. Once we've made the, the, the diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma, we've subcategorized it. Um, I know it seems complex, but there really are only three or four main subtypes that we really need to talk about, especially in the context of a setting like this. The most common subtype is the clear cell type. This represents about the vast majority of all sporadic type renal cell carcinomas. Then there are the papillary and chromophobe renal cell carcinomas. These are really the usual types. The, the much less common type is a collecting, type, a collecting duct carcinoma, which is more like a urothelial cancer. It behaves more like, like that. It's a little bit more of an aggressive type of renal cell carcinoma, but these are really the main four that we need to be concerned about. They're each unique based on their gross appearance, and these are all partial nephrectomies. This is a complete nephrectomy down here, but partial nephrectomies and look at the gross appearance. They're very unique. Look at their microscopic appearance, the clear cells of the clear cell, the papillary architectural growth pattern of a papillary tumor. These chromophobe, this unusual eosinophilic cytoplasm of the tumor cells, probably doesn't mean much to you, but means a lot to us and also some of the clinicians. So they have very characteristic gross microscopic, and also they have very unique biochemical, and as Dr. Kim alluded to, very um, specific molecular and genetic profiles as well. This is all really evolving as we speak. They also, um, and this is a small graph, but we all know that, that the different subtypes behave differently. Some behave better than others. So it's really important that we subclassify these renal cell carcinomas based on their, on the appearance, all the appearances that we talked about. The, and the other thing that Dr. Kim alluded to, and I think we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, and I won't get into detail on this, but just to point out that the subclassification, um, subcategories are, um, they respond differently to the different armamentaria that we have in terms of treatment modalities. Um, and so it's very important for the pathologist to specifically subclassify the type of renal cell carcinoma. So on any standard pathology report, you're gonna see the diagnosis, renal cell carcinoma, that's what it is. And then the subtype, somewhere buried in the report, it'll say clear cell type, papillary type, chromophobe type, or something like that. So that's an import, one important aspect of it, the diagnosis. The next important aspect is really the cancer stage. And the cancer stage is dictated um, really by the size of the cancer and its local, the local growth. Is it extending is it staying confined to the kidney? Is it extending outside the kidney into the local fat? Is it going to any regional lymph nodes that, that might have been removed? Or is it extending into the, the adrenal gland which might have been removed as well? And so we analyze each case based on what we have and what we see. This is a typical example of a partial nephrectomy specimen of a clear cell renal cell carcinoma with a margin that's out here. Here it measures about 2.1 centimeters, the margin's negative. This is a very small, tumor of clear cell carcinoma, this would stage out as a T1A, a pretty low stage tumor. This would have a pretty good prognosis based on, on that, on that uh, staging profile. Now compare that to this particular tumor, which is a complete nephrectomy specimen showing the kidney, a lot of perinephric fat. Here's the sinus of the kidney. And here is the tumor out here, much bigger, about nine centimeters. It's growing into the fat. It's growing into the sinus fat. It's demonstrating more aggressive local growth. This would stage out, this is a microscopic showing it extending into fat. We would stage this out as a T3A tumor. 
because it's obviously more, it's larger and more infiltrative. A different example would be a same thing, a renal cell carcinoma, clear cell type. This is a full nephrectomy specimen. Here's the kidney. Notice, though, the tumor is extending into the renal vein. This is another feature that we analyze to look for. We look for it grossly and microscopically and look for tumor extension into that vein because we know that this will upstage the tumor, the overall tumor stage, and this is associated with generally adverse outcome. It's telling us this tumor is behaving more aggressively with its local growth. In a case like this, we might have received a lymph node. This is a lymph node with metastatic clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Again, another aspect we would analyze both microscopically and under the microscope, or um, uh, grossly and microscopically. So we take all these features once we've analyzed the, the, uh, the tumor and we apply a grading system. The American Joint uh, Council on uh, Cancer Staging, the AJCC, and we apply the pathologic stage. Why? Because as Dr. Kim alluded to, and we all know that cancer staging, and it's true for any type of cancer, the higher the cancer stage, the more aggressive that, that tumor will likely behave, and therefore the, the therapy needs to be tailored to that particular stage. Okay, um, and the report will clearly, should clearly dictate what is the tumor stage, and that's part of the standard reporting of any good cancer report. Um, cancer, the final cancer features I'm gonna talk about are resection margin, the grade, uh, vascular invasion, the presence of necrosis, and then this unusual sarcomatoid or rhabdoid differentiation. These are elements which go beyond cancer staging and the diagnosis. Um, here's two examples. Let's talk about resection margins. Uh, these are indirectly related to, or they, they indicate, um, the local ag aggressiveness of a tumor if it's growing to a margin. It's, ideally, it's ideal that when a partial nephrectomy or a complete nephrectomy, as we have here, is performed, the surgeon always tries to get the whole thing out so we achieve negative margins. That's optimal. Sometimes it's not possible, especially when we have a high-stage renal cell carcinoma like this, which is extending into fat. Sometimes it's impossible to get a clear margin. This might, again, portend some additional therapy uh, when it comes to therapeutic uh, uh, time for therapy. With a smaller resection, sometimes it's impossible to get a negative margin, or the surgeon needs to go back and take a cleaner margin that's interpreted for frozen section analysis, whatever, to try and clear out that margin. Again, because optimally we want, we want to uh, try to achieve a, a negative resection margin. The next factor is vascular invasion. Uh, vascular invasion, when the tumor invades either into, into those lymphatics that Dr. Kim talked about at surgery, they have a propensity then to go to lymph nodes, or they can go into veins or even sometimes arteries, and then they have, unfortunately, the capacity to go to the lung or bone or other sites, those confer an adverse prognostic indicator. Those are an indicator that this tumor might behave in a more aggressive manner. So if we see it microscopically, we include it in the report. Also, if there's tumor cell degeneration or necrosis that is usually associated with aggressive gross growth of the tumor, and we too will report that because sometimes that um, um, will dictate how the next round of therapy will be undertaken. Dr. Kim already talked about tumor grade. We apply, the pathologist applies the tumor grade. The Furman grade is the one that's used for renal cell carcinomas, and it's a grading system from one to four. Really, it, it delineates the, the degree of differentiation. Grade ones are well-differentiated tumor. Grade four are poorly differentiated. And in any type of tumor, it doesn't matter if it's breast, colon, renal cell carcinoma, generally well-differentiated tumors behave better than poorly differentiated tumors. So we assess the tumor under the microscope and we assign a, a grade based on our observation. And then finally, sarcomatoid or rhabdoid differentiation. Most tumors will have just one type of differentiation. This is an example of a renal cell carcinoma. The vast majority of it was this typical clear cell type renal cell carcinoma. Oops, sorry. The conventional type. Um, but in it, there were some pockets where the tumor cells sort of had this unusual morphology under the microscope called sarcomatoid differentiation. Or over here, where the, we have this rhabdoid differentiation. You can see it looks very different than clear cell. These, for whatever reason, are associated with tumor aggressiveness. So when we see this, 
We need to report it, we need to quantitate it, and we put it in the report because these mandate some additional therapy uh, independent of stage because they are really associated with um, aggressive tumors. And all of these last category of features that I talked about, once we've observed them, we include them in the report, and again, usually enter any standard RCC report will have these features indicated in them uh, because they will potentially impact um, on uh, the therapy. Two quick categories, and then I'll be, I'll be done here. I was asked to say a, a couple words about hereditary gen genetic syndromes associated with renal cell carcinomas. And um, again, this is taken out of that, that long list that I, I presented a few slides back. We all know that there are well-known, well-defined uh, syndromes, genetic syndromes or familial syndromes that are associated with increased risk of developing different types of neoplasms, including renal cell carcinomas, notably von Hippel-Lindau, uh, tuber sclerosis, Berthog debay these sorts of things. Um, the bottom line is, as a pathologist, I can't look at most of these tumors and say, this is a clear cell carcinoma. It's clearly von Hippel-Lindau, tuber sclerosis, or whatever. All I can say is that it's clear cell carcinoma. Um, so there are a few types of tumors that I can look at, and if they have unusual morphology, like this tumor up here or this tumor up here, I could say they don't comfortably fit into the typical types of renal cell carcinomas. Maybe it is a syndromic type of carcinoma. Very, very rare, less than 1% that we would ever suggest that to a clinician that maybe is this is syndromic. But what we can do when we get samples like a renal, like a renal resection, like these three different, three different cases where there are multiple tumors, here we have multiple tumors or multiple cysts with here we have maybe 20 or 30 different tumors in this particular kidney. Or here's a, a younger patient with one, two, three separate tumors. Then we can suggest that there's something odd about this because we do usually don't see this in sporadic type tumors. Maybe it's associated with a genetic syndrome. So multiple tumors, cysts, a young age presentation at a renal cell carcinoma or unusual histology, we'll, we will suggest to your treat treatment team that maybe this is a genetic or syndromic pattern of renal cell carcinoma. There's going to be more on this this after or later this morning on this topic. The final topic for one minute, I was asked to, to, to talk a little bit about the performance of secondary slide reviews. It's kind of important. It's really important. When you come to an institution for your definitive therapy, it's always good to have that team, and we do this all the time, review the outside slides to ensure that you have an expert team who works with your treating physicians. And we work as a team through tumor board reviews and discussions of each, almost every single individual case to ensure that we have the correct diagnosis. We've had the critical elements included in that report. We've under, we've, we've, that the, the specific uh, special testings have been performed and we have accurate diagnosis and staging and things like that. What you need to do to provide is, is when you come here is to provide the um, a copy of the report and a set of the glass slides, the so-called recuts. We sometimes call them the recuts. That's really all we need to provide that incoming secondary review. The other scenario is when you go off, you might need to go off somewhere else for, for some additional testing or some additional therapy. And in that situation, you might need to take or you should take a set of slides with you off to that institution because they will probably want to do the same thing and review to ensure that we're all talking about the same disease process. Remember that your slides and blocks when you're treated here or whatever institution, generally those tissue blocks are stored in an incredible huge file either in the basement of the hospital right below us here or in a warehouse as we have down in Torrance. They're basically saved forever. So when you need to go somewhere in five or 10 or 15 or 20 years, God forbid that there's a recurrence and you need to get some additional testing, we can pull those blocks out of torrents, create a second set of recuts or a third set or fourth set, and we can send it off to wherever it needs to go for some additional testing or evaluation. And what you need to do is fill out this authorization form here at Cedars if you're, if you're being treated here at Cedars, and all you need to do is check off, get a copy of the pathology report, and please provide a set of recuts It'll take a few days, two or three days. We'll get that for you. We can send it to where it needs to go, or we can give it to you directly, and you can just carry it with you to that next institution or wherever you need to go. 
All right, on that note, I uh, thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions uh, either now or during the break. I, know, I think I'm a little bit over. Thank you. So in our efforts to try and stay on time, Dan's available for a few minutes and let's take a coffee break and come back in 15.